So um, Harold set us up nicely for this, the first part of my presentation. So you think you have a sick building. Um, you've had an indoor air quality study or you're just not sure. So how can you tell? Just follow the paper trail. Your absenteeism rates are up. Um, it's not the World Cup. People still not coming to work. So you know you have a you know slight idea that there's a problem, and there's an impact on your uh, your um, productivity and your profits. That's a big issue for your you as a company. Your medical insurance rates will eventually go up. So maybe your um, your agent is discussing your options for your company. Uh, every year you're having to fork out a little bit more. The, the insurance agency is actually maybe a good sort of starting point to, to capture this, the issue of multiple staff illnesses. And then serial sickness, the rapid spread uh, of, of uh, conditions across your company. Your, your airborne system, airborne uh, diseases are, are rapidly distributed through poor ventilation. And you can also have uh, conditions that promote the growth of mold and bacteria and other pathogens which are surface, uh, form on the surfaces of, of, of objects such as your door handles, your keyboards, your chairs, etc. So there's multiple ways that, that you can um, contract illnesses. But if you have a rapid spread of, of illness through your company, you probably have some sort of uh, either building related illness or sick building syndrome. What is a building not necessarily sick? Well, you can have faulty ventilation equipment. You can have a, an exhaust fan that shuts down when it's not supposed to, and all your bathroom smells come wafting into your, your office. Uh, you can have damaged uh, sewage vent pipes, which is a, a fun one. Um, all of a sudden, you get this horrible, pungent smell drafting through your building, and everybody tells me, oh, the AC smells bad. Well, the AC doesn't smell bad. There's an odor in your air conditioning system. Um, I worked on a hotel many years ago, uh, where they were complaining that this meeting room would get this pungent odor, you know, every now and again for no reason it would just show up. Well, I went to a, so I, I did try to lift the mic, but it, it broke away from its face, so. Is that better? All right. I'm not about the other one. All right, are you hearing me better now? Yes. Yes. yes? yes. All right. All right so I, I went to a, a training seminar in that same very conference room, and I got up to use the washroom. When I came back, everybody gave me these dirty looks. Well, I could tell why as soon as I walked back in because it smelt, the place smelled horrible. But that then sent me back the following day to go and investigate above the ceiling in the washroom. And it turns out it was a cracked vent pipe from during the construction. So just because you are getting a smell in your air conditioning system doesn't mean that you have a problem with your air conditioning. You have a problem somewhere else. So those who have seen me working on a site, when I start sticking my head up in ceilings, there's a reason why. I've done it before. I know where things come from. And uh, sometimes it's a shortcut. Mr. Hazard of the jury raised a question of comfort cooling. Yeah, it's not a sick building, but you do have an issue with comfort. Um, and that, uh, that will be addressed later on in my presentation when you consider how you're supposed to set up your air conditioning system uh, and what, where you're going to place people relative to your heat loads. Um, unfortunately, you know, the architects have to take a little knock on this one. We in Barbados love to put a desk right by a window, south face, south facing window uh, in the corner office. Well, I can make that room 60 degrees and the person will still be hot because the sun's shining in on you, you're going to feel hot. There's not much I can do about that. So how we lay out our space is going to make a big difference. So some of the causes of it. Well, I'm looking at this from an air conditioning perspective. Your design of your air conditioning system. Inadequate air change rates. Now, um, There's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to introduce air into your building. Um, and how you do that and how much air you're going to bring into your building depends on the application. If you have an office setting, it's going to be fairly standard. 
you need to allow for X amount of air changes per hour. If it's a gym, obviously it's going to be a greater number of air changes per hour. I've been in some gyms in Barbados where the smell of sweat towards the end of the day is overpowering because all they've done is stick an air conditioning system. They haven't considered how you're going to change the air and how, how, what your needs are on a daily basis or even an hourly basis. And we have passive ventilation systems and active ventilation systems or positive ventilation. So passive is where you just allow your system to suck air in from the outdoors. And a positive is where you actually have a fan blowing air into your plant room. Um, I had a classic case of a building um, a few years back, small industrial complex, where they had um, CO2 sensors on the, on the outdoor air dampers. So the idea is that when your CO2 levels build up, the, the motors will drive the dampers open, allow air in, and then shut down. That's supposed to save energy. Only problem is that they had a large number of exhaust fans pulling air out of the building, which meant that when you open the front door, all the air flew in from the front door. Your CO2 levels never rose. The dampers never opened. And because they were in Barbados in a nice salty environment, those dampers froze shut. So you never got the air into the plant room. The air came in through the front door, through every open crevice in the building. It's just sucking all this dusty and hot, moldy air into the uh, hot, humid air into the building. Sorry. So how you set it up, your ventilation system has a key impact on on what your your comfort cooling and what your conditions are going to be. Too big or too small when you're specifying your equipment. If it's too small, obviously nobody's going to be comfortable. Everybody's going to complain about being hot and sweaty people will be disgruntled. If it's too big, you can have overcooling, so people are too cold. Another problem uh, that results from overcooling or your system being too big is that it shuts down the cooling system very quickly. Your air is still circulating, but it's not act actively cooling the air. So the moisture stays in the air. So you get cold, wet air circulating, people feel uncomfortable, it gets clammy, and it's a perfect environment for the growth of, of mold and, uh, and other pathogens. BMS systems. Now, building management systems can be wonderful tools or incorrectly applied, they can make the situation worse for you. That example he just gave you of the CO2 sensors being designed for energy efficiency and actually causing more problems than they were worth. I'll get back to that on a later date when I give you some examples, but just bear that in mind. Poor maintenance practices. We've seen this one before. Your filters, your first line of defense against dust and other contaminants in the air. If you don't change them regularly, obviously you are, you're risking not only dust getting through or low airflow because they get clogged up, but they can also introduce their own pathogens because they become harbors for uh, and, and locations for mold and mold growth, etc. And that gets into the airstream. Your coils, if they get full of sludge and dirty, they don't transfer heat as well. It means you're not dehumidifying your space and you, you end up with high humidity, another uh, perfect scenario for mold growth. A low refrigerant charge can do the same thing. If it's not cooling properly, you don't feel good, the humidity levels stay high. This last one might surprise you, component failure. If a half a system can be worse than a whole system or no system at all. The reason for that is that you still have cold air, but you're not dehumidifying. You can, you can work in this scenario. People can still, still come to work, still function but your humidity levels are high, your indoor air quality drops. And people start falling asleep, they start getting sick. It's worth it just to keep your, your maintenance on a consistent basis. So there's some other factors we have to consider. When you start your design, 
what happens frequently is uh, the architect goes to the client or the project manager goes to the client. I said, do we really need an engineer? It's just an, a necessary cost. You know, we're just putting some air conditioning systems in, you know, nothing big. Well, even if it's just to get your initial perspective from a professional's point of view, it's worth it. Because everything that Harold just discussed and everything that I'm about to discuss with you can be prevented with the right advice. I may tell you, no, you don't need me, you do X, Y, Z, or here's a couple of guidelines to follow. And the question I have then is, does the project manager or the architect have the duty to inform the client of the risk of not having an engineer on board? Because later on down the line, the client's going to come back either to the architect, the project manager, or the air conditioning contractor and say, this is not working for me you need to fix it. And, and I'm, I'm not paying for that additional expense. So it's a risk to everybody, not just the client, but it's also a health risk for the client. Something to think about. Services on friendly building design. Too small is not a fit. Sometimes when I'm asked by an architect what I need in terms of space for my equipment, they balk at the square footage I'm asking for, or the space in the ceiling with an access panel. Good Lord, those access panels look horrible, don't they? What happens when you don't have proper access to your system is that you can't service it properly. You can't get at the filters, you can't get at the coils, you can't remove a motor if something's going wrong, you can't service things properly. For the sake of a few square feet or an unsightly ceiling access panel, you're going to risk the long-term viability of the project. So the, the old adage of you can't always get what you want has to go both ways. This is a big one for me, the lack of enforcement. We have an inadequate system of checks and balances in Barbados as far as I'm concerned. There's no requirement for any air conditioning design to be verified by a registered engineer. Anybody can go on the internet, look and see how many air changes you need, throw a line diagram together, and that's approved. We don't have any inspections or certification required for, for air uh, comfort cooling systems in Barbados after they're installed. Think of it, we have inspections of electrical installations we inspect public elevators every year. We expect public pools every year. Restaurant facilities get regular inspections. You know, so you either have init initial or annual inspections. We have air conditioning systems running for 20 years and nobody's even verified that they're still operating properly or that they actually initially did what they were supposed to do. I'll get back to that in the solutions for new buildings section of my discussion, but uh, that's a big one for me. Lack of proper commissioning. I've been called into jobs where there's a problem, where I haven't installed it, or designed it, should I say, I don't install. And it was never gonna work in the first place. Somebody put it in, yeah, that looks good, sealed it up wasn't going to work. Either too big, too small, the air wasn't getting back. It just didn't work. And people struggle on with that and then complain that they have a problem with their, their building being sick. Well, it started off wrong in the first place. It was never going to get right by servicing or changing this or changing that. Occupant practices. Carol alluded to some of these, but I've got some doozies, and I've seen some. Boxes sitting around the office. I got called into a, 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 a site the other day. They were complaining about the air quality. People sitting there with windows open, oh, it smells musty. Every time I come in here, I sneeze. Everybody had about five or 10 boxes, cardboard boxes full of paper next to their desk because they were a financial company. My first question is, don't you have somewhere to store this? Yeah, but it's too far. 
There's nothing that cockroaches like more than cardboard and cardboard that's been there for years because I guarantee you they take the files out of those boxes, put them somewhere else and replace them in the same cardboard box with a file. So that cardboard box is staying there for years and just degrading, full of dust mites, disgusting. Photocopiers. Well, as photocopiers become more compact and technologically advanced and can produce more copies, they produce more pathogens and chemicals into the air. So when you're doing a new design now, we, we like to recommend that you have them in an enclosed room that we can properly vent. It doesn't always work. So be careful what you're selecting in terms of, kit, of office equipment. If you are going to have a high speed, high volume copier somewhere, you need to put it in a room and ventilate that room properly. Uh, Carl can, I'm sure, tell you of the number of times he's gone and found, you know, the, the copier dust all over the vents and all over the, the, uh, the offices because it's just been spread into the atmosphere. And cleaners. The cleaners that, uh, that Harold referred to are sometimes your worst enemy. There's a project I worked on years ago where they were complaining about high humidity levels in the building. And uh, one of the things we identified was that an employee who um, had uh, lost his employment at that, at that particular space decided to get into the cleaning business. So they gave him the contract. It was a carpeted building and he would clean every three months. Except that he cleaned every three months by washing the carpets and using a domestic wet vac to suck up the water. These were ceiling uh, floor tiles, carpet tiles. You picked up the carpet tile, it was soaking wet underneath the carpet tile because he used the wrong equipment and he used it incorrectly. So yes, you were cleaning, but you're introducing standing water into your building. You know, if we have a change in the number of persons occupying a space, obviously, you know, equipment, people, usage goes down or goes up accordingly. Your system may not be designed for that. That's uh, specifically a problem with a speculative building. You have to assume what your load is going to be. And uh, sometimes you get a standard office space that a call center moves into, which has four times the density of what you're normally expecting. So it's hard to, to accommodate that, those uh, wide fluctuations in occupancy. So what are some of the things we're going to consider when we were uh, the critical decision uh, design cons concerns for uh, a healthy building? First of all, you've got to know what the usage is going to be, what sort of activity. If, you have, if you're designing for the aforementioned call center, obviously you know your occupant density is very high. If you are designing for an office, then you know what the average density of an office is going to be. Or you do have a floor plan that indicates these many people are going to be in here. And this is the sort of activity. A caution then to people who design speculative office buildings is, uh, from the landlord's perspective, is if you do have an office building and a call center wants to come, uh, they either have to do some serious retrofitting or you have to turn them down. Right. The number of persons in a, in a space isn't just the number of bodies, it's the, number, the amount of equipment, the type of equipment, how it's going to be used, all that sort of thing. Your operational hours. Standard 9 to 5, you're working on weekends, the 24-hour operation. If it's 24-hour operation, you, you don't have your external heat loads anymore because the sun's down. You have to make provision for that. Your system is designed to deal with your peak load, which is the heaviest load you're going to experience during the day. If you're operating at 3 o'clock in the morning, you have to introduce some, a false load, which is called a reheat, to trick the system into thinking that everybody's still there. So you have to be cog cognizant of that. Either your system has to be able to ramp down to, 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 to deal with the, the reduced load, or you have, to you have to increase your load. The ventilation, the air exchanges, and filtration. How many people are going to be in your building? 
is it going to widely fl fluctuate? So here's a fine example. Um, in this space, I might use it for a training room for 10 people, or we may have 80 people as we have today. Your system has to be able to accommodate that without penalizing you on days when you do have 10 people. That's when your CO2 sensor comes in, in handy. You can allow more air into your system or back it off and you have a minimum amount of air to deal with the 10, room, 10 people in training room scenario. Your floor plan layout. Open plan, offices, a mixture of both. Most of our offices are going to be open plan with a couple of corner offices. That's something I'll pick up on later when we, when we talk about where we, um, where we want to go sense the return air. You have to position your sensors for optimal performance. So in the case of your return air temperature sensor, you got to pick up the heaviest load. In the case of a CO2 sensor, you don't necessarily want it next to your indoor, um, indoor your outdoor intake, because that's going to that's going to trick it into thinking there's enough oxygen. And serviceability. Maintenance of your system is a key. When I say system, I'm not just talking about your air conditioning. I'm talking about your building. They all work as one or they're initially designed to work as one. If you only maintain the roof and the windows and you don't maintain your air conditioning system, you're going to have problems. If you only maintain your air conditioning system, and you don't maintain your windows and your roof and your doors, you're still going to have problems. They're designed to work as one to make sure that your building internal environment is maintained. So Mr. Hazard inadvertently raised the issue that I'm going to cover next. Your corner and perimeter offices are going to be where you got your heaviest load are. So Mr. Hazard's sitting next to a window, sun shining down on him. Everybody else is cool. He's not. Put yourself in a corner office when the sun is rising or the sun is setting. Everybody else inside the building is nice and, uh, nice and cool, but you're going to be suffering unless you have blinds to stop the sun. You are representing the heaviest load. So your sensors have to be positioned to pick up that heavy load to make sure that your cooling system can react to your load. If it's reacting to the internal spaces where everybody's nice and cool, you're going to be suffering. As a consequence, you don't feel comfortable. Everybody else does, but not you. And unfortunately, the corner office is usually reserved for the big boys and girls, right? They're the ones that are going to complain the most. So what happens then is that uh, in, in other scenarios, when, when your system is sensing the nice, cool indoor air and not the heat load on the perimeter, it shuts down too quickly. Then you're not, when you, as I told you before, when you're not co actively cooling, you're not removing moisture from the system, from the air, air flow. So then your humidity levels rise. There's nothing worse than being warm and moist, except if you're having a cup of cocoa, warm and moist is nice. On your skin, when you're fully dressed for business with a tie on, not so good. So here's the example that I'm referring to. Popular design practice has the sensor back at the return plant room, uh, the, uh, the return air duct in the plant room. So we're sensing the average of all the, the, the temperature of all the spaces, internal spaces, external spaces. That's coming back maybe, call it 70, 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 22. So this building is orientated northwest. The east-west axis is the long axis of the building. Sun rises in the morning. You got the heat load on the eastern side of the building. As the day goes on, usually in summertime, it's, it's more the sun is more uh, on a southerly path. So your south face gets most of the load. The afternoon in the west, you got the wet the load on the west of the building. Where your corner office 
down here, southwest corner, still has a load from the south, and he's now getting the load from the west. So he's got the heaviest load in the building. But our sensor is back at the plant room, and it's telling the, the equipment that it's still 72 degrees. Person in the corner office is, doesn't agree, but there's nothing that the system can do about it. So he's going to suffer. The recommendation is to make sure that you're sensing that temperature in that room. That's your heaviest load. Your system is going to react to that. Then you can balance the rest of your system so that everybody else feels comfortable. But if you can't satisfy the heaviest load, somebody's going to be unhappy. So now we come to the examples that I've come across in my uh, 26 years of practice. And uh, although he's not here today, I have to give credit to my managing director, Jerry Date, who has 40 plus years in the business. I was fortunate enough to learn from him, uh, to be corrected by him when I made mistakes and have him look over my shoulder. Not everybody has that, uh, I acknowledge that. Uh, so I, w I have been very fortunate and um, I'm glad that I'm given this opportunity to relay some of that to you guys today. So this, the example that I'm using for the first one was a, uh, what I consider to be a poor air conditioning design. Commercial split system, a passive outdoor air intake, so there's a duct running down from the roof, branches off to a couple of plant rooms, and the, the system is supposed to suck air in through that duct. It's a bank in operation with offices on the ground floor and offices on the first floor. People complaining of respiratory illness, staff requesting transfers or resigning. So quite significant impact. So two indoor air quality studies were done and they concluded that there was a significant IAQ issues and recommended industrial clean, improved maintenance practices. Now this building was between 50 to 20, 15 to 20 years old. We inspected the ductwork uh, because part of our commission was to redesign a space and then come in and uh, just investigate what the issues might be in terms of the indoor air quality. So we found some very dirty interior surfaces. When I say dirty, I use that word sparingly, as you'll see in the next photograph. That's the inside of the duct. And the green arrow is pointing to a clump of accumulated dirt at the discharge grill. The image on the right is the color of the duct before it got dirty. So it's supposed to be bright orange. That first image was dark brown. There was loose dust and construction debris all over the duct. So it's a two-story building on Broad Street. Passive, unfiltered outdoor intake from, a, from the roof level. So the building is sucking from this duct. We have people walking in and out off of Broad Street. And we know that Broad Street is full of cars, right? Exhaust, dust, and fumes. What you saw there was all the, the dust and dirt from the vehicular exhaust and the dust in the environment being sucked into the building through the doors, through the passive indoor intake, the unfiltered in, uh, outdoor air intake, and accumulating on the inside surfaces of the duct for years. So before you do an industrial clean, you might want to change your ductwork. There's nothing you can clean outside of that ductwork that's going to save you. You also have to change the way your building operates. You can't have it sucking air from anywhere. You have to introduce filtered air and make sure the building internal pressure is positive to keep. If you've got people walking in off the street, every time they open the door, the air must go out. Can't come in or you end up with the same problem. Uh, just to note that the ductwork image that you saw there was uh, fiberglass ductwork. So cleaning it is not recommended. You clean it, you're going to rip the internal surfaces of the ductwork and you can get loose fibers of uh, fiberglass flying all over people's desks. Not recommended. 
Building number two, the change in occupancy levels. Again, commercial uh, split system with passive outdoor intake, fiberglass duckboard, some on the outskirts of Bridgetown, offices on the ground on first floor, storage space on the uh, on a part of the ground floor. A three-story speculative building. The complaint was that multiple staff were getting ill. Some had to be hospitalized or, or work from home. Indoor Air Quality Study Commission noted that there was no, no appreciable amount of airborne spores but there were spores, uh, also there was a uh, mold on the, on surfaces. In this particular instance, somebody put a keyboard in a in a drawer, and two months later opened it up, and it was a, an entire different ecosystem down there. It was covered in a thick layer of mold, but nothing on the desk, nothing apparent. Humidity levels were very high. This is uh, coincidentally the same place that the cleaner came in and, uh, and uh, soaked the the tiles and left them wet. Third floor was occupied by a separate, another tenant with a separate system, no such issues. So what is the story here? Well, our inspection of the ductwork revealed this. Remember that orange picture before? This is green. This is mold on the inter internal surfaces of the, of the ductwork. The AC contractor had installed UV lamps in the air conditioning units had recommended fumigation, all these fancy things. But this is live mold in your air, air distribution system. I'm not sure that UV lights can deal with this. So what happened here was that the company's business model changed. You used to have 15 to 20 people on each side of the floor, an air handling unit serving each side of the floor. People started traveling for work or working from home, so you ended up with five or six people. Office is empty. All of a sudden, your unit that is designed to deal with the load from 15 to 20 people is dealing with a load of five to 10 people per floor. And you have no control over your outdoor air intake. Your building is negative. So now your system is too big. And what I told you before about oversized units is that you end up short cycling is what we call it. You end up with high humidity. You end up with mold growth. If you have mold in your building, it will propagate. On the ground floor, the same size system that was used for the offices was servicing a storeroom and a spare parts room. Absolutely no load. So they were, that started off wrong in the first place. The system was way too big, no windows, nothing because it was secure sore. It was just a tight box. Nobody in it, no lights on because it's, it's just parts. Absolutely no load. So they were just uh, making their situation worse on that floor. So we recommended obviously replacing all the ductwork. My words to them were, replace the ductwork at night. Do not let any of your staff see it. If you do, you'll face a lawsuit. That was my sincere warning to them. If I had seen that ductwork as an employee, then I would have been suing, especially if I'd ended up in hospital. Introduce positive filtered outdoor air to the space. Make sure that you are controlling the volume of air and the condition of the air that goes into the space. We had two air handling units per floor. So what we recommended was that we have one system dealing with part of the floor and install separate split systems in the perimeter offices. What we also did there is connect a small supply from the central system into each office to make sure that they were getting air circulating through those offices that had individual split systems. It worked. No more issues with mold, no more issues with indoor air quality or people getting sick. Third one, BMS sensor issues. This one I like. This is, this is a, 
this is going, this was a building that was designed by an engineer. And um, it's basically what I consider the incorrect application of technology. So it's a three-story office building. It's got energy recovery ventilators in the plant room, which is supposed to ensure that the air that's brought in is exchanging energy with the exhaust air. So you, you, know, you, you bring in tempered air. And these ERVs are controlled by CO2 sensors. Well, they've got high relative humidity issues, comfort cooling issues. So people complain about being warm, too cold, humidity is up in the 70s, nobody's happy. So you've got the system set up to introduce tempered outdoor air into the space through the v ERVs. Your washroom exhaust fan is on continuously, which means whether the ERVs are working or not, air is being exhausted. Again, if you're exhausting continuously, the air has got to be coming from somewhere. So infiltration is preventing the CO2 levels from rising to the point where they trigger the ERVs. You're getting air being brought in from outdoors, from the stairs below, through the actual ERVs that are off without actually tempering it. So you're penalizing your system by making it not be able to take advantage of the tempered air. So we're just sucking in air from anywhere that we can because we have to exhaust the washrooms. Nobody wants to smell the washroom coming back, right? That's what I was just talking about. The CO2 sensors are stopping the ERVs from operating. Consider that if you, um, if you are tempering your, your air using the ERVs, what's the penalty on the system for bringing that outdoor air in? It's pretty minimal. It's not a lot of air but it's enough air to keep you comfortable. So why not just have the ERVs running continuously? Energy efficiency is going down because you're not leveraging the, the, uh, the ability of the system to replace your, uh, to, to, to cool your outdoor air. And beyond preventing it from working properly, <clears throat> the ERVs are designed to exhaust a space that needs to be exhausted and bring air back into the building. In this case, they put the ERVs in the plant room, so the air that they are exhausting is not contaminated air. It's the, actually the return air to the system. So it's not actually changing the amount of air in the building. It's just circulating air. Meanwhile, our exhaust fans are pulling air out. So this building is still negative. We've not introduced air through the ERV. All we've done is circulate air, change the air that's circulating back through the building. So it's an incorrect application of two, two um, forms of technology. Well, our recommendation would be to disable the sensors, let them run, and for them to operate in, su in supply rich mode, which means that they can exhaust 100 CFM and they can supply 200 CFM. At least you're adding some air to the building, which is replacing the exhaust air that's been taken out. That will balance your building air flows for positive internal pressures and relative to the external space. Just to make it a little bit clearer for you, I did this automation, this animation here. So we have our system set up, constant exhaust from the washrooms. We've got outdoor air being brought in, which is at 10% higher than the amount that we're exhausting. The CO2 sensor stops the air from being brought into the building, but we're still exhausting. Now we have air being brought in to the building through the doors, which could be out. You know, they could be right onto Broad Street, as I said, or just hot air being brought in through the office space. And that affects your entire system balance. So how you apply your technology makes a big difference to the success of it and the energy efficiency of the system. So energy recovery ventilator um, is a 
it's basically a couple of fans or or, or two fans, uh, one or two fans, depending on the system. Cold exhaust air is being pulled from, say, a washroom or a photocopy room, and hot outdoor air is coming in from outside. It goes through the system, and the warm outdoor air or hot outdoor air exchanges energy with the cooled exhaust air stream through a membrane. It, it could be a cross-plate filter or a, uh, a, a membrane for tra heat transfer. So by the time the air, the outdoor air is, is sent into the space, it's cooled down, it's lost some of its moisture. The air that's been exhausted has picked up moisture and it has is, is gotten um, warmer. Sorry. So you're not penalizing your system by bringing in hot outdoor air. You're tempering it, so it'll come out. If it's out 80 degrees outside, it might come in about 75. So you, you're reducing the energy that it's bringing into the building and you're leveraging that cold air that you're exhausting and making sure it goes out at a higher temperature. Everybody clear on that? There'll be a quiz afterwards, so. And so, retrofitting challenges. I do have to wrap up shortly, so I'm not, I'm not gonna go too long on this. So how bad is your problem? If there's mold growth, well, you got a problem because chances are your employees have seen it already. If there's mold in the AC ductwork, then you do, if it's a fiberglass ductwork, you need to replace it. If it's galvanized, you can actually call in a cleaning service and deal with it. If you need to change the ductwork, can it be changed without significant disruption to the occupants? That's not always the case. Sometimes it's a simple ductwork system. Sometimes you have to take down entire ceilings. So you have to schedule that. How I was, what was uh, referring to unplanned maintenance and AC changeouts. Well, this is one of the big ones. If it's a problem with the equipment selection, well, then you may have a bigger problem because you have to replace the, the equipment or find a way, as we did in the, the uh, occupancy example, of leveraging the existing equipment, abandoning some, and making sure that it's, it's right for the size of the, the project. After all of this, will the problem be fixed? Well, that's a big one. Uh, as Harold indicated, you have, if you, if you just come in and rip stuff out without knowing what you're doing, you might not solve the problem. You may delay it for a little while and start from, from ground zero and get back to, ground, to, to, to um, the same situation in short order. But your biggest problem is whether your staff believe that you fix a problem. Because if they're convinced that this is a sick building, there's nothing you can do. That's why buildings get abandoned when they are, when all it takes is some investment and putting in the right system to start with. You'll be happy to know this is the end of my first part of my presentation. Uh, and we will be discussing solutions for new buildings coming up later on. Thank you very much.